Um, it's my pleasure, pleasure, and not without excitement, I must say, to accompany you through this um, event. So today, the Bonn Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies will open its growing exhibition, an experimental format that centers physically around four display cases that are located at the University of Bonn's museums and research collections of the Collection of the Americas at Oxfordstraße, the Egyptian Museum at Regina Pazersweg, and the Department for Asian and Islamic Art History at Adenauer Allee. The decentralized displays are bound together by this fourth um, display case that you see here, uh, displaying items of all three categories represented in the exhibition, and an especially designed website and online um, exhibition that will be introduced to you later today as well. This experimental and innovative exhibition format continuously and transparently includes the visitor in the processes of knowledge production and exhibition design. Over the next years, the exhibition will keep growing and expanding until finally leading into an exhibition event that also concludes the first funding phase of the Bonn Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies. Over the years, we will all gain insights into the question of how materialities shape and form dependencies and vice versa. Tonight, we're officially opening this amazing exhibition that has been developed over the past two years. The continuous interest and support for our ideas, visions and research by the University of Bonn as a whole is represented today by the presence of our Vice Rector, Andreas Zimmer, and the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Volker Kronenberg. Today's third welcome address will be delivered to you by Stefan Konermann, BCDSS speaker. Following the welcome addresses, Nikolai Grube, Julia Hegewald and Petra Lindscheid, on behalf of the entire exhibition planning group, introduce the concept of and plans for the exhibition to you in further detail. So I'm very much looking forward to this evening with all of you. So first I would now like to invite Andreas Zimmer to join me here on the stage. Andreas Zimmer has been Vice Rector for Research and Early Career Researches uh, for the past six years already. So he has observed the development of the BCDSS and has been, been with us for all the way, so to say. So I'm very happy that you're joining us for this next milestone of the BCDSS today. So welcome, Professor Zimmer. Well, thank you very much uh, for this country introduction also. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here. Um, we are, as a university, extremely proud to have this uh, a cluster of excellence. Uh, I think it's uh, a, a cluster very much in the heart of our university. Um, it, why is it in the heart of our university? Because it, first of all, really uh, addresses a very important subject and it is, uh, has a very interesting combination of, of researchers from dis different areas uh, who to come, to, uh, come together and, and, and perform research together. And so this exhibition, uh, I'm a neuroscientist, um, so exp exhibitions are not in the center of my expertise, but I've never seen something like this. So I, I think it's a very interesting format. It's interesting because it is an exhibition that is kind of alive. It will keep on growing. It will keep on growing at different places. It's accessible uh, uh, through the internet, as is this live stream. So it's a very, it's a fantastic format. Um, and I'm really looking forward to follow this format, actually, over the next uh, couple of years. So in the way, this exhibition actually reflects the structure uh, of the cluster. As I mentioned, that is one subject, uh, slavery, uh, that's at the center of the cluster, but it's studied from different perspectives. And it's the comparison of the different cultural perspectives that make it so interesting uh, uh, to me as, uh, as, as somebody who is not so much in the field, but I think that's also um, uh, for, for, for you uh, who are at the, at the center of it, uh, um, very fascinating. It also, there's a second thing, it highlights the importance of our university collections. It's, we as a university are really fortunate to have a fantastic collection, to have so many museums. And it shows that actually these collections are really a rich treasure um, 
not only because they are important exhibits, but they are also subjects actually of your research activities. So I think it's, it's, it's fantastic actually to see how these collections actually can, can really feed into the cluster activities actually and help the cluster also to, to develop. So these are uh, the things that really fascinate me. And then when I looked at, uh, at what is exhibited and, and how things are developed, I must say not much has changed in the last couple of thousand years. So the subjects that you're showing, textiles, for example, as, a, as an object <coughs> or as objects actually of, of uh, asymmetric uh, dependencies, I mean, we have this today. So we have a fashion industry, we have fashion that's so expensive that, that normal people cannot afford it, so it shows your status actually in, in, in society. But more importantly, actually, many textiles are produced under, under extreme labor conditions. So I'm afraid that some textile that I am wearing may be actually produced by small children uh, in, in some Asian countries, small children who should better go to, uh, to school. And so it kind of, I think if we look at an expo exhibition like that, we also have to reflect about our own behavior. <clears throat> so next year, I'm sure we will all watch the world champion soccer, uh, world championships in Qatar, even though we know actually <clears throat> that the construction in Qatar was maybe not built by forced labor, but under labor conditions that are inhumane. <clears throat> and yes, actually, we, we still benefit from that. And, and we're willing, actually, to accept that to a certain extent. We also use all good, luxury goods. That's another luxury foods, but we can talk about luxury food. Another important issue, we need for our luxury good, for example, raw earth materials. And these raw earth materials are produced by under inhumane slavery-like <coughs> conditions. So slavery is a, is a subject not only of the past, I think, or asymmetric dependencies is the subject of the present. We also accept and, and that, I mean, I bet many of the goods that we are wearing here are produced in China. And yet we know China is a, is a country that severely oppresses actually freedom <coughs> in their own uh, minorities or majorities even. <coughs> but we still accept it. So what does it tell us in a way? <coughs> I often wake up in the morning and I think I must be the, the luckiest person in the world <clears throat> because we live in a, in a free society, in a free democratic society where <clears throat> I don't think we have eliminated uh, hunger, we have still have social problems, <clears throat> but I think our children actually have the be are in the best starting position anywhere in the world actually. Their, their future is actually um, they can shape their own future. They are not forced, actually, <coughs> uh, to do things uh, that they don't want to do or need to do. <coughs> so we live, live in a free, uh, free society. But freedom and democracy, actually... So I, I'm, as, a, as a natural scientist, I know that there is nothing like a constant equilibrium. It's always a struggle. And for us, we always have to struggle and preserve the freedom and the democracy that we have today. <clears throat> so if we look at this exhibition and the objects and think about slavery, actually, we think we should, first of all, become aware that the freedom that we have, actually, uh, we have to really stand up for it and, and make sure that, that we maintain the freedom <clears throat> and that we have. And we should also reflect on actually how we interact with other countries, how we use our goods, and if we really want, <clears throat> or we, if we can really accept to use goods that are produced 
under conditions that we all deplore. So these are serious words, but uh, I'm extremely happy. I think we have to have this discussion. Um, um, we have this thought, I, I, I think, and you probably plan to produce this kind of, to induce this kind of discussion with your exhibition. And I wish you good luck with that. I think it's a very important and timely uh, subject that you're studying here. Uh, it looks back in the past, but it's relevant for our presence. Uh, I wish you good luck. I think it's exciting and please keep on going. Thank you very much, Professor Zimmer. I hope that we can deliver answers to some of the questions that you have uh, just raised in your welcome address. Uh, for the next welcome address, I'm happy that uh, Professor Volker Kronenberg, Dean of the Faculty of Arts, is here. Uh, most of our research can be located in the Faculty of Arts, who has always had our backs. So we're happy to deliver some visual results uh, back to you today. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Mrs. Bischoff, dear Prorector Zimmer, Stefan Konermann, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is a special honor and pleasure for me to address a few words to you today in the context of opening this Resources of Power exhibition. The announcement of the exhibition as an experimental growing Decentralized exhibition itself has already given me the impression that this project will become an extraordinarily interesting and exciting project within the Bonn Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies Cluster of Excellence over the next years. The title of the exhibition, Resources of Power, How Things Tell of Slavery and Dependencies, not only sounds extremely promising, but will hopefully also draw the interest of many visitors to this exhibition, which will continue to evolve in the years to come. It is precisely this innovative methodological approach of turning the process of conceptualizing and planning an exhibition into its very subject a process that will always involve reflection and discussion about the contents of the exhibition that I find so intriguing. On the basis of objects that relate to the materiality of three resources groups, grain, luxury, go uh, luxury food and fiber, the exhibition aims to tell the millennia old story of slavery and asymmetrical material and social dependencies. And while we are on the subject of millennia of history, on this day, not quite a distant in the past, but nonetheless still 232 years ago, one of the most formative events for Republican political culture and one that can hardly be underestimated in its, symbolic, uh, in its uh, symbolic effects took place in France on July 14, uh, uh, 1789, with the storming of the Bastille and a symbol of oppression. How appropriate it is, therefore, to deal with freedom and bondage on this day, even though it is the stated aim of the BCDSS to overcome the binary dichotomy of freedom and slavery and to introduce the concept of asymmetrical dependence. This is why I find it exciting that the exhibition wants to illuminate networks 
of dependency in particular, which, as is described in its exhibition announcement, arise from the fact that people control access to resources and the things they produce and consume. Pro Rector Zimmer also reflected. Consequently, it is intended to engage with the dependencies that we humans cannot escape because we, at least the vast majority of us, no longer live self-sufficiently as individuals but are part of a global economic network and, as a consequence, are also entangled in its various forms of dependencies and their implications. Various collections of the University of Bonn, Janine Bischof already mentioned, and Pro Rector Zimmer, and the region are involved in this exhibition, thus also reflecting the extraordinary interdisciplinarity of this cluster. As Dean of the Faculty of Arts, I am particularly pleased to see the cluster flourishing as team spirit and intense networking between the research areas is yielding excellent research work. In the process, shining a spotlight on young researchers in particular. I am therefore also optimistic that this exhibition will contribute in an innovative, comprehensively and very visible way in bringing the research results achieved by the BCDSS to a broader audience, thereby increasing not only the public visibility in and around Bonn, but hopefully also advancing the international visibility of research in the humanities at the University of Bonn. I would like to already express my sincere gratitude today to all participating museums and institutes that will contribute to this exhibition and also to the future cooperation partners of this exhibition. I will follow the future development on this exhibition with great curiosity and wish all of you, especially the initiators from research area B of the BCDSS, much success and good luck for this promising project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kronenberg. Um, the third welcome address by um, Professor Konermann, our uh, speaker, will be delivered via Zoom. Good afternoon to you all. I regret not being able to join you at Niebuhrstraße today. At the same time, I'm thrilled that technology makes it possible for me to join you anyway via Zoom. As the speaker of the BCDSS, I'm especially proud to be part of this exhibition opening today. Ever since the application phase, we wanted to develop an exhibition that introduces the so-called general public to the concept of embodied dependencies. Over the last two years, this very broad and undefined idea has been sharpened into a concrete and innovative concept that will not only present the results to our visitors, but actually make them part of the experience. Research Area B of the BCDSS, Embodied Dependencies, approaches the phenomenon of slavery and other types of strong asymmetrical dependencies by including a pre-colonial and a post-colonial perspective. Disciplines involved in this research area span fields and eras ranging from Egyptology over art history to Christian archaeology. The diversity of these disciplines and the development of a common language among them can at times be a challenge, but it is always an opportunity. Just as at the beginning of this year, the working group Embodied Dependencies was set up 
to implement interdisciplinary exchange and foster collaborative theory building. One of the aims of this working group is to create an overarching methodological and theoretical framework that will be visualized by the growing exhibition and its resulting fine exhibition. From my experience in this group, it is quite amazing to see that when PhD candidates, postdoctoral researchers and professors discuss on an equal footing, it takes no time at all for visionary ideas to develop and new connections to blossom between our different disciplines. I'm already looking forward to seeing how this group and therefore the theories of embodied dependency will develop further in the future and what impact they will have on all the disciplines involved in our cluster. Enough of theories though. This exhibition will be one, if not the most important visual and accessible result of the Bond Center for Dependency and Slavery Studies. As the BCDSS speaker, I'm proud to see how this research exhibition will give insights into the process of knowledge production, how it will let us all be part of the development of the exhibition design, and how we as visitors will therefore be able to actively participate in the many negotiation processes that in the end will become the exhibition. This is an experiment that I would not want to miss for anything. And I'm sure that visitors from all over the world will feel the same. Speaking of all over the world, thanks to the online exhibition that encompasses the four Disney cases exhibited in Bonn, literally everyone who wants to will be able to visit the exhibition. We had developed the idea of having a virtual version accompany the actual exhibition early on, but only the past year has shown how important it is to think digital solutions alongside physical ones. I'm now looking forward to hearing more about the exhibition and experiencing the accompanying online exhibition. Thank you to research, and thank you to Research Area B for this exhibition, and thank you all for your attention. And um, as promised and as already announced by Stefan, uh, we will now um, get to the point where you all get a detailed look into the exhibition uh, planning and conceptualizing presented to you by the represent of representatives of the exhibition planning group um, by Nikolai Grube, Julia Hegewald and Petra Lindscheid. And um, yes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your kind words of introduction, dear friends and dear colleagues. Um, in the remaining time now, my colleagues Julia Hegewald, Petra Lindscheid and I would like to give you a short introduction to the exhibition and the underlying scientific concept. The exhibition and its concept are the outcome of discussions between the members of the research area B, embodied dependencies. In this research area, we focus on the way how materiality and the world of things is related to slavery and dependency. And I actually have to, can you help me? <laughs> <clears throat> yes, we have a small presentation. It might be too small for all of you to see on the um, monitor, but um, at least those who join us through um, the internet will be able to, to see the details. <clears throat> um, objects can provide um, access to the topic of dependency on many levels. On the one hand, objects such as chains can themselves be instruments that serve to establish and reinforce relationships of dependency. Images and artworks can bear witness to social practices linked to extreme inequality. 
On the other hand, the way resources are used and goods are produced and consumed is deeply embedded in social asymmetries. Therefore, the relationship between humans and the material world can also provide an analytical framework for the study of dependency. Simply what a person wears and eats, for example, we have heard this um, in, the pres in, in the welcome ad address by um, Pro Rector Zimmer already, indicates their social position in a system of asymmetrical dependencies. Within such a framework of material, environmental and social dependencies, the exhibition narrates a long-term history of slavery and strong asymmetri asymmetrical dependency through objects and texts related to the materialities of different resource groups. For this exhibition, we have chosen to focus on three resource groups that are particularly closely linked to the history of dependency and slavery, grain, stimulants, and fiber. The history of domestication of grain is closely interwoven with the emergence of social inequality and hierarchically differentiated societies, but also with the notion of territoriality and control of land and water. The production of and access to stimulants was one of the driving forces for colonial expansion and the establishment of slave labor on plantations worldwide. The history of sugar, for example, is linked to slave labor, but the control of the spice trade has also led to major asymmetrical power relations. And when we think of fiber, cotton plantations immediately come to mind, which are virtually emblematic of the use of slave labor. In the same vein, we should keep in mind the working conditions of modern textile factories in Bangladesh or maquiladoras in Latin America. The three resource groups and their references to dependency and slavery are presented in this exhibition in four showcases in four different locations. One showcase here in the Niebuhrstraße serves as an introduction and is intended to present the concept of the exhibition. The other three showcases each are dedicated to one of the resource groups each. Nevertheless, no sequence is intended in the showcases. Each showcase can also stand on its own and can be visited and understood independently of the others. The small, our small current exhibition provides a momentary insight into an ongoing discussion process that will extend over many years and will reflect the work of the cluster of excellence as a whole. Since this is a research exhibition, we decided to develop a new and more open concept for the exhibition in which the process of knowledge production and exhibition design are continuously connected and related to each other and are made transparent and comprehensible. We want to implement the concept of such a growing exhibition by elaborating the relationship between material resources and dependencies with a small decentralized inaugural exhibition. This experimental exhibition will be expanded in subsequent years, culminating in a hopefully large and um, final exhibition in, um, uh, in the clusters uh, final phase of 2000 or evaluation phase in 2024, which will offer insights into ongoing discussions about dependencies and engage visitors in this entire process. The current growing exhibition is composed entirely of objects drawn from the university's diverse collections and museums. It thus also documents the great potential of the university collections, which make it possible for us to trace the global history of dependency and slavery from ancient Egypt to the present in an exemplary way. We would like the attribute growing of this exhibition to be understood in two ways. On the one side, the discussion process on the materiality of dependency relations will continue over the next years. On the other side, more objects will be included in the exhibition. Since we don't have enough space in the showcases, 
No, this cannot, cannot be done here um, in the showcases itself, but we have created a website for this purpose, which will allow us to add and discuss more and more artifacts from the holdings of our museums and university collections. The work, the exhibition which you see here is the work of all members of Research Area B, Embodied Dependencies. But it would not have been possible without the active support of the museums and collections and their curators. I also would like to mention the great work of the designers, Cora Aktogan and da Daniel Perrodin. And in the final phase of the preparations, um, Petra Lynchheit, Julia Hegewald, Hegewald and I worked together um, as a um, very effective um, exhibition team. We received excellent support by the staff of the BCDSS, in particular from Janine Bischof, Meltem Dramali, and Imogen Herrad. Last but not least, I would like to thank the three, the three student assistants, Stephanie Stab, Claudia Braun Carrasco, and Joeline Dahmer, who took care of the object descriptions, the website, the exhibition flyers, and the installation of the showcases. Well, I will now turn over the microphone um, to Julia Hegewald, who will introduce the Stimulants Showcase. I have to fix the uh, mic quickly. <laughs> Hope that works. Yes, I too would like to welcome you all very warmly to this uh, opening today under unusual circumstances. Um, my name is uh, Julia Hegewald. I'm professor of Oriental Art History here and one of the principal investigators in the cluster. And my role in the exhibition was or is that I'm the coordinator for the Stimulants Working Group. In German, we would say Genussmittel or Stimulantien. <laughs> The um, stimulants uh, display cabinet um, is um, uh, very close to us, just around the corner on this map. Um, you can see us in Nieburstraße and uh, the other um, places where the showcases are on display. So you can see they're all in very easy uh, walking distance. The history of the exploration of foreign countries, colonialism, dependencies and slavery have long been intimately connected with an exchange, trade and an extraction of precious plant products from Asia, Africa and the Americas. And a strong motivating force driving this expansionism was a desire for rare and initially often exotic stimulants such as spices, wine, coca, tea, and sugar, all um, substances which are on display um, either in this combined case or in the stimulants uh, display cabinet in uh, Adenauer Lee 10. If we provide a really quick uh, history of um, dependencies and stimulants, we might start with the uh, trade of Mediterranean wines within and beyond the Roman Imperial Empire in the early centuries of the Common Era, the European late medieval search for Eastern sources of spices, from the 15th century the extraction of tobacco, chocolate and chili peppers from the Americas, but also coca as a stimulant uh, stimulating production at first under the Incas, but then also under the Spanish. Of course, the transoceanic colonial enterprise has already been mentioned several times, plantations in the Americas and the start of uh, African slave labor. Uh, the Mamluk Sultanates and the Ottoman Empire, particularly involved in the trade of sugar and tobacco in the 17th century, the development of uh, European trading uh, companies, um, for instance, uh, in South Asia in the 17th, 18th century, um, you know, led to uh, the annexation and colonial dependencies. Through to the 20th century industrialization and trade of stimulants such as tobacco, but also coca, which then evolved into cocaine, which today in the contemporary period led to new uh, dependencies. Now when preparing um, the display cabinets generally, um, we followed a number of aims. A few have been named already, um, as you can see on the screen. 
um, we definitely wanted to uh, combine and show exhibits from a variety of world regions. All materials here now from the collections of the university. Um, we wanted to show different materiality, such as stone, metal, textiles. And in the stimulants working group in particular, we wanted to show a diversity of stimulants. And we wanted always to connect the objects, the art objects, with the plants. So we combined here, for instance, a spice grinder with, with spices um, to kind of show the connection between the original product and the object. In our uh, joint cabinet here in Niburstraße, which combines exhibits from all three resource groups, um, stimulants are represented, as I just said, by a, a black a stone spice grinder from India, illustrating the colonial suppression of the country and the extraction, not just of spices, but also of other highly valued goods. Now, the display cabinet in Adenauer Allee um, combines um, four levels which focus on stimulants. And here we have, for instance, a wine jug from the New Kingdom in Egypt, shown on the screen at the moment, combined with uh, grapes. We have a coca bag from Bolivia, shown with coca leaf or leaves, and below it a silver plated colonial teapot and tea leaf illustrating colonial and trade relations with India and the Far East. The search for Asian sources of caffeine, tea and coffee led to explorations towards the East and European trading companies such as the British East India Company were active in the areas. From 1820s onwards, they um, began to cultivate tea uh, very intensely. They annexed Assam, which before had not been used for tea, um, uh, growing tea. Uh, now tea was really produced on a commercial uh, scale, and this demanded dependent workmen and women to allow for this massive uh, expansion, and this in the long run led to colonial annexations of land. Now such uh, luxury items as tea and coffee were brought to the West and became really desired stimulants uh, for the middle classes and led to the development of entirely, uh, an entirely new group of objects such as teapots, uh, containers, strainers in porcelain, in iron, and here, for instance, uh, a silver-plated uh, silver metal uh, pot. The final exhibit in this uh, display cabinet is a uh, Mamluk sugar molasses jar from Jordan. And we know that the workforce in Jordan and Palestine for sugar production production in the 13th to 14th centuries was a combination of peasant corvee and uh, slaves. I hope this gives you a small impression of uh, the display or stimulants, how we uh, examine them in the uh, context of uh, dependencies. And I'm handing over to um, Nikolai Grube to tell us more uh, on the, um, the grain display. Thanks very much. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you very much, Julia, but I think I need the whole yeah. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. well. well, I will continue now to uh, provide you a short introduction into the um, next display case, um, which um, focuses on grain. And, um, on brain, Getreide, and this display case is um, <clears throat> can be seen in the um, um, Egyptian Museum <clears throat> in the in the main building of the university. And um, <clears throat> well, let me talk. Let me introduce you a little bit um, to the concept of the showcase. We focus in this uh, showcase on the, um, on the domestication of grain. The domestication and cultivation of grains have occurred at different times in different regions of the world. We know that from 
approximately 10,000 years ago, certain grain species began to predominate in several places far apart from each other. In the Near East, these included uh, wheat, barley, lentils, and legumes from 8,500 before Common Era onward. In Asia, rice from 8,000 BCE onward, and soybeans from 2,500 BCE onward, and in the Americas, maize from 7,500 BCE and beans from 4,000 BCE were cultivated. Oh, sorry. Um, domestication is a process of increasing interdependence between human societies and specific plant populations. With the consolidation of the cultivation of grains, a surplus production became possible, which meant that certain parts of the society no longer had to concern themselves with the production of food. These are the origins of specialized craft production and the stratification of societies, and thus also for asymmetrical dependency relationships. The domestication of grains as staple food, however, also made people dependent on things that were essential for the production and distribution of food from grains. The spectrum ranges from harvesting knives, equipment for the preparation of food, such as grinding stones or mortars, storage buildings, terracing and containers, to equipment and roads for transportation. Finally, the cultivation of the land meant an investment in labor. Cultivated land thus becomes an important resource. Water and hydraulic systems for irrigation also had to be built, controlled, and monitored. In our showcase, we want to display the emergence of asymmetrical dependencies by focusing on barley and wheat in Egypt and the Mediterranean region from 8,500 BCE onwards, rice in Southeast Asia, and maize in America. Well, let me show you some of the objects which we have included in this showcase. Remember the painted wooden figure of a woman grinding corn is an example for servant figures which were produced for burials of rich people. The figures were believed to magically animate so that they would make sure that the deceased did not suffer any lack or hardship in the afterlife and would have access to daily supplies of both basic foodstuffs and luxury items. A series of Ushepti figures from Egypt represents the prototypical field labor and the hope to save the deceased from this hardship. These magical minions illuminate aspects of Egyptian concepts of labor, social dependency, and questions of identity. Due to the temporary closing, the Akademisches Kunstmuseum cannot provide any objects, but contributes a photograph of a reproduction of a relief with Demeter, Persephone, and Tripod. Tryptolemos, which depicts the sacralization of staple foods. This is an impressive example for the degree to which human prosperity and well-being depends on fertile soils and good harvests, on, and in particular on divine assistance. Then the showcase also includes a bread stamp from the 7th century from the Dölger Institute and it is an example for the practice of stamping loaves of bread, which was widespread in antiquity, the purpose being to indicate the quality, the type, and the maker um, of the bread. The Bonner America Sammlung contributes four objects to the grain showcase. This polychrome uh, painted plate from the classic Maya period was used for serving maize bread. Such precious painted plates were reserved for the nobility and thus refer not only to the different social classes in the classic Maya world, um, but uh, the wealth of the nobility was mainly based on the products and goods from the labor service that dependent peasants and slaves had to offer. 
And this small grinding stone from Central America is also um, a loan to the exhibition from the Baza collection. It is a miniature version of a large grinding stone on which corn was prepared into dough. The production of grinding stones required hard stones, such as granite, a very precious resource whose access was controlled and limited to a small section within society. In fact, there is a small detail which I always find very interesting. The, um, the majority of the population, the peasants, did not have access to hard stones, to hard grinding stones. And so they used local stones, which were limestone. And um, today we can see, in, when we find uh, in archaeological exca excavations, when we excavate the teeth, and we see a difference um, in the teeth of uh, noble people, which show no abrasion by, um, because the stone is hard. And uh, lower class people have um, uh, severely destroyed and eroded teeth because they use uh, soft limestone, you know, uh, grinding stones. Finally, um, no, not finally, but uh, the third object from our Baza collection um, is uh, a figure of the Aztec mace goddess Chico Mecuatl. Um, this is a reproduction which is represented here, and she represents the counterpart, the female counterpart to the male mace god Sintiot. She thus represents the dependence of humans on the divine forces that protect and even possess the crops but also stands for the gender-specific division of labor in the fields. A fourth object from our Baza collection um, is the early colonial Keru from Peru. Kerus were used to serve chicha, which is maize beer. The production of chicha was based on a complex system of commensality and reciprocity, typical of Andean societies, which embodied kinship obligations and dependencies. And finally, in our timeline, which stretches from ancient Egypt to the present, we see a, an object from India, which is a kolam, from the collection of the Department of Islamic and Asian Art. Kolams are usually drawn freehand by allowing rice flour to flow between the thumb and index finger. These, uh, the columns illustrate the reciprocity of humans and gods in relation to the resource of rice. Yeah, thank you very much. And now we continue with uh, the presentation of the textile showcase uh, by Petra Lindscheid. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good evening, all together. Um, besides stimulants and grain, textiles are the third resource group treated in the exhibition. The textile showcase is located in the Baza Museum, the Bonn Museum for the Americas. Textiles like food are a basic need of human being. Therefore, the activities connected with obtaining of raw materials and with textile production play a significant role in the economy and in the cultural life of societies. This holds true for all cultures and in all periods, and the various collections and museums of the University of Bonn possess meaningful objects related to textiles from the antique Mediterranean to the pre-Columbian indigenous societies of the Americas and to modern Asia. As a basic handicraft, textile work was always and it is still connected to various aspects of dependency. To the availability of resources, to forced labor, to unequal gender roles, and to technological process, uh, progress. Sorry. Uh, the exhibition shows objects embodying these dependencies, which are similar throughout various cultures and time periods. 
The textile showcase is arranged according to the, ver to the steps in textile production. The beginning is marked by the obtaining of resources, namely the harvesting of cotton plants or flax and the domestication of sheep, camelids or silk worms. These fibers, especially cotton, have different histories in the old world and in the new world, and their rise and fall is largely depending on political power relations. The spindle from modern Peru in the Baza collection, which you see here on the slide, holds a bundle of raw cotton ready to spin. It stands for the cotton plantation economy in the 17th to 20th century America continent, exploiting large number of wage laborers and labor slaves. The first step in textile production consists of spinning the raw material into a thread. This was done mostly with a hand spindle, like this example uh, you see on the slide, from, uh, which is uh, exhibited in the textile showcase. Um, this example of a spindle from modern Ecuador, uh, which belongs to the Baza collection. Uh, spinning, as a female, uh, spinning as a typical female activity symbolizes the traditional subordinate role of women. Spinning, spinning tools became typical attributes of women as exemplified by this terracotta statuette from late antique Egypt uh, in the collection of the Franz Josef Dölger Institute. Uh, it depicts a woman with a distaff which is part of the spinning equipment. After spinning, weaving is the next step in textile production. The textile showcase exhibits this large size linen cloth um, from pharaonic Egypt dating to 3000 to 300 BC, the dating is not so precisely yet, but uh, surely this uh, textile belongs to the pharaonic period. It belongs to the collection of the Egyptian Museum of Bonn University. This large sheet, which when you unfold it measures three meter in length and one meter in width, illustrates the tremendous effort which is needed for weaving a work which is often done by slaves. Dependency relations connected with weaving continued, as we all heard uh, by several speakers, uh, until the modern era, uh, until the modern era when dependent wage laborers in textile factories of the 18th century stand at the beginning of industrializ industrialization in Europe. The woven textile is processed into a garment or a furnishing textile by cutting and sewing. This step is visualized by a fragment from the upper part of a loin cloth housed in the Baza collection. This garment is uh, at least 500 or maximum 1,000 years old and it belongs to the Shanghai culture in Peru. This loincloth, which you can see uh, by the stains on the textile, was heavily worn and used over a long time span, forms a sharp contrast to the fast and cheap fashion of today's textile industry based on the exploitation and forced labor, mostly in Asia. Textile production can be followed by elaborate decorations. The curtain exhibited here in our uh, uh, showcase uh, is from contemporary uh, Gujarat in West India and it is made from cotton and decorated with applique and embroidery. Curtains like this 
hung over doorways and niches containing sacred objects. Cotton is the most important fiber material in South Asia, playing a significant role in the regulation of dependency re relationships of different social groups in the region. Last but not least, at the end of our introduction of the various showcases, we want to draw your attention to the website of our exhibition, uh, which, is, which is inaugurated today. You can see the, uh, the link here, and you can see a screenshot of the starting uh, of the homepage. This webpage, like the um, exhibition itself, will grow continuously through the weeks and through the month uh, by the addition of new objects resulting in new ideas and new insights into various um, concepts of dependency. Thank you very much. I hand over the microphone to Julia. Round up with another two slides. <laughs> Just to round up with another uh, two slides to look ahead into the future in more detail, then we have had lots of hints to what is going to come. The four display uh, cabinets which we have opened this afternoon, which you can see on the screen. One is, of course, also in front of you here are part, as you have heard, of a larger, a growing exhibition which will continue to develop and expand, uh, culminating in a large show. And this more substantial exhibition showcasing also other uh, embodied dependencies. Here we have focused so far on resources, resource dependencies, but we can think of family, of monetary, of uh, all sorts of uh, depend labor dependencies, gender dependencies. We will inaugurate in uh, 2425, towards the end of the first phase of the cluster funding period. And the exhibition is fully funded through the cluster and the curator, Wolfgang Stumpfe, has just been appointed and will, uh, will join us very shortly. There will be a number of national and international partners involved who will be involved in the exhibition planning, but also, of course, in object loans to expand the, uh, I mean, we have wonderful collections here, but we hope to uh, include some uh, really substantial and major examples also from other museums. And we are also uh, engaged in negotiating with a number of venues here in Bonn to find uh, the most suitable site to show our exhibition. We also hope that it might be shown at other sites in Germany. And it might uh, even be shown in the Museum of Slavery in Liverpool in the UK if our negotiations are fruitful as they look at the moment. So please follow the progress of our growing exhibition on our webpage. Also, as uh, Petra Lindscheid just pointed out, because we are adding more and more exhibits and information um, over the next months and years, culminating then hopefully in this wonderful, very large, fully grown show on which we are already intensely working. So we from the um, exhibition group, uh, thank you all for having come and I'll hand over to Janine. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, thank you to the exhibition planning group representatives uh, for giving us this uh, really, really exciting and vivid insight into how everything is going and how everything will develop over the next years. And I'm guessing I'm speaking for everybody who's listening that uh, we are all even more excited now about the exhibition than we were before. So this brings uh, the official part of our uh, event today to an end. And I would like to thank you uh, once again, the welcome address givers, uh, the exhibition planning group representatives, and last but not in the very least, um, I would like to mention once again, the massive really enthusiastic, precise, and um, really always available legwork that the student assistants put in prior to this exhibition opening. So thank you especially to you, and thank you everyone for joining. <laughs> <laughs>